Um, and it's great to be back actually speaking in person. It's been a while since I've actually got to be in front of a lot of folks talking. So I think this will be a great uh, presentation with some good stuff. Um, but uh, I've been to Belgium several times. I've never been here before. This is an amazing venue, uh, awesome area. I've never seen so many people riding on bikes uh, before. We don't use bikes as much in the United States, uh, so it's really cool to see everybody actually out there and kids walking. Uh, it was really neat. Um, just a brief introduction to myself. Um, my name is Dave Kennedy. I've been in the security industry for over 20 some years, uh, which means I'm getting really old. Um, but I, I run uh, and the founder of TrustedSec and Binary Defense. Uh, I was a chief security officer for a Fortune 1000 company for a number of years. And uh, really, my whole focus has always been uh, building cool tools, releasing awesome research, and uh, making the industry better for whatever I can. So that's been me. Uh, I'm also on the news quite often. Uh, I helped out with the TV show Mr. Robot. I was in a Chris Brown rap video, believe it or not. That was really weird. Um, never thought I'd be in a rap video. I, I, my, my wife actually makes fun of me because I don't know how to move uh, to the beats. So it's actually funny. I was doing the rap video and I was bobbing my head and the producer's like, uh, yeah, can you stop bobbing your head, please? I'm like, okay, no problem. Uh, uh, I've testified in front of Congress. I've been on the Katie Kirk show and a number of news organizations. Um, most recently um, with uh, all the stuff that's going on in Iran. So I don't get nervous very often uh, speaking in front of folks. It's kind of my, uh, my, I guess, superpower on that front. Um, but I get socially awkward with people. It's really weird. But uh, when it comes to the news stuff, you know, you think going in front of the news, you get nervous. But I really don't. Uh, but recently, uh, I ran into an issue. So when you go on the news and you go on national news, so I'll do like CNN, BBC, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, CNBC. I'll do all the different news organizations. And uh, recently, we're talking about Iran. And I came in as a uh, expert on cyber warfare and stuff like that from my military intelligence side of my background. And, uh, and they got the segment mixed up and they introduced me as Iranian nuclear expert. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if any of you all have ever sweat underneath your nose or your ears before, but it's possible. Um, I was extremely nervous at that point because I know nothing about anything Iranian nuclear or anything to that effect. And I'm live on national TV with millions of people watching. It's like their top, you know, prime time night show. And the Iranian nuclear expert was supposed to come on after me. I was supposed to be the cyber person, but they got it flipped wrong. So I'm now the Iranian nuclear expert. And so you have a, a couple of seconds, like literally like three or four seconds to decide what the hell you're going to do, because you're like either I, I correct them on national TV and say, hey, I'm not an Iranian nuclear expert, or you, you try to bullshit your way out of it. And um, I unfortunately panicked and tried to BS my way out of it. And uh, so I, was be I became an nu Iranian nuclear expert. Um, and I knew nothing about what I was talking about. They're like, yeah, what about the treaty of 1983? I'm like, yeah, that treaty. Oh, my gosh. It's uh, whew, not doing good right now, right? You know? I was, and I tried navigating it towards cyber. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but the cyber stuff that Iran's doing. They're like, yeah, we have an expert coming on next that's going to be talking about cyber. We don't need to worry about that. I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, it was bad. But uh, you get to do really fun stuff uh, on there. And um, I run two, two companies. We just released or we just uh, opened up our headquarters uh, downstairs uh, over the bottom left of Trusted Sec. Uh, really cool building. Uh, got a, a huge conference center in it. And it's really cool. I have an artist uh, painting a mural. And in the mural, it uh, has a bunch of binary. And if you decode the binary, it gives you a link that you can only do internally for an internal CTF to win prizes. So we try to you know, make the themes throughout the whole building uh, pretty neat and have a lot of fun. And last but not least, I own a DeLorean um, from Back to the Future. So I, it doesn't fly or do time, time travel yet. I'm still working on that. But, um, but uh, that's my side project is working on a DeLorean, which they are actually really horrible cars. Uh, it definitely can't get to 88 miles per hour uh, in any way, shape, or form. I'm lucky to hit 60 miles an hour. Uh, but yeah, yeah, anyways. But that's not why we're here today. Uh, my talk today is, is really about adaptive adversaries. And what that is, is if you look at... Um, 10 to 15 years ago of what we had to deal with from a security perspective today, it's, it's vastly changed, as you would expect. Technology progresses, uh, the security industry progresses, offense and defense progresses, we have better visibility than we ever have. And so you look at what's happening both from an adversary perspective around organized crime groups or ransomware groups to nation state, uh, nation state groups, the capabilities of attackers are always increasing. You know, we saw with Conti, you know, dedicated research divisions. Um, if you saw the Conti leaks, I thought one thing that was really funny uh, was uh, uh, there's always a debate on what's the better editor, VI or Nano. And uh, if you looked at the translations in the... <laughs> Let's not get into that right now. I mean, we all know Nano's better, but uh, uh, I know I offended you by that one. But uh, 
it, you, it's funny, one of the uh, Russian hackers was uh, getting access into a system and they had a help desk here that you, know, you could escalate help to if you ran into a situation where you couldn't break into the company or something. And uh, the attacker was basically saying like, what type of, of horrible hell is this editor? How do I exit it? And he was talking about VI. And uh, the help desk had to be like, you know, hey, you just hit the colon, Q, you know, exclamation points or whatever. So that was, that was pretty funny. Um, but we see the, the sophistication continue to grow with adversaries and our defenses have to marry that. And what's interesting is if you look at um, a lot of organizations, they're still at a very basic level of security. Even if you have an EDR product or all this technology, what you find is that if an attacker is changing their techniques or changing the way they look at an organization, it largely circumvents that. We actually need people looking at logs, looking at telemetry data, building detections and understanding behavior in our own environments. And these types of things are expensive. They take a lot of effort and work to understand our own environments. And that's what we run into today. In 2014, I gave a talk with a good friend of mine, Kevin Mitnick. And Kevin and I are on stage talking about how uh, we as an industry have to focus on adapting our techniques and not focusing solely on vulnerability scanners and looking at that. And what was interesting uh, back then is that, you know, you, f you go back 10 years, and a lot of you look fairly young, so maybe it's a little bit too far back, but uh, 10 years ago, not Edwin, you look old, um, but uh, just kidding, man. <laughs> 10 years ago, you know, we were focusing solely on technical findings. So you'd find an exploit or a vulnerability, you'd exploit that vulnerability, and then from there you'd do privilege escalation, you'd do lateral movement, you'd get access to a domain controller. Once you had access to the domain controller, you got access to all the data. We didn't focus on the flow of that attack, we focused on the myopic technical findings of that to address. And so, you know, when I was a pen tester, you know, back then, it was awesome because I would literally go into a company, I'd break into a company, they'd patch the individual findings, and then next year I would do the exact same thing, just find a different vulnerability, and well, a lot of times they wouldn't even fix that vulnerability, so I just break in with the same vulnerability. And then it was the same thing over and over and over again. It was the easiest thing ever. Like you get a week long pen test, and by Monday you had access to everything. So then you would just write a tool for like four more days. You know, I'd release a new version of the social engineer toolkit or magic unicorn or whatever, because I'd already done everything the first day. Now it's much more challenging today to do that. You know, it's actually gotten much more difficult to break into organizations. We've seen advances in Microsoft and Apple uh, in devices that we use. We have to find flaws, we have to find misconfigurations, we have to circumvent detection criteria. It's no longer you know, running Shikata Guy Ney and Metasploit as an encoder to get around antivirus. It's a lot more complex than what we have to deal with today, and that's a good thing, that's a good thing. And what we started to see early on, about 10 years ago, is really the blending of red and blue. Red and blue working together. Uh, I remember you know, red was kind of the, the mystical magic creature that would come out and run some awesome exploits, and then all of a sudden now you'd have a report and then you'd have to fix those findings. It's changed. We understand offense now and we can build better defenses against that. So when you look at what we've done in the past just 10 years alone and where we're focusing our efforts on, the, the blending of red and blue, the purple side of the house, has really made defense substantially better with everything that we're seeing. The issue is, is that the return on investment in security is still a challenging thing to communicate. Uh, I was a chief security officer for a Fortune 1000 company uh, for a number of years. And one of my favorite stories, uh, I, I worked at a, a company called Diebold, and uh, they're a manufacturer of ATM machines. Uh, I came in after the voting machine issues. I just want to throw that out there, that I wasn't there during that, that period of time. Um, but when I was there, uh, what I really enjoyed was being able to work with IT. We were actually friends. Like, I bought them beer and pizza because I used to, like, break stuff all the time, so I had to like repair that every time. Um, but we had a good relationship with one another, and one of my favorite times uh, at uh, working as a chief security officer was, uh, it was at DEF CON, and uh, we had found a flaw in SCCM that allowed you to patch SCCM and use the SCCM server to deploy malware to the entire company, okay? So you're using the patch manager process to patch the entire company of malware, which I thought was awesome. Um, and I did live on stage, I had a, a lighter and there was some heavy metal music playing in the background, and I passed all of our production instances with malware uh, at Diebold. So I had like 50,000 shells raining in the background uh, at, at DEF CON in front of you know, like 5,000 people. It was like the coolest moment ever. Um, but when you look at, at complexities of security, it's often difficult for organizations, especially in the medium-sized area, to have dedicated security personnel, to be able to understand what's actually happening out there, to have people that can handle and manage and own that network infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, application side of the house, all of those start to become really, really challenging. And so the complexities around security is still a major issue. Uh, 
Justin, who runs our, our research division, you know, is right in this. Uh, you look at how some organizations, and I would say when I say some, it's, it's below 5% of organizations have the capabilities of being able to understand emulation and simulation capabilities within their own environment. I mean, it's a very small percentage of companies that can actually detect new tools that come out, uh, modify techniques and attacks. It's a very small percentage of companies that are still at a level that we consider advanced or even close to being above average when it comes to what we see out there. We look at Lapsus as an example. I, I thought Lapsus is an interesting one. Uh, the Uber hack recently uh, that, that happened and uh, the, the gaming company as well. Uh, it looks to be that, you know, Lapsus is a, a bunch of teenagers, right? They, they broke into Okta, they broke into uh, LG, they broke into Microsoft, uh, you know, had source code for Bing. They were able to get into a lot of different areas and these are a bunch of teenagers that have offensive capabilities that, you know, at 17 or 16 years old, I would say is pretty awesome. Uh, at that point in time, leveraging cloud infrastructure and being able to, to get access into some of the largest companies out there that have dedicated security teams. Um, what's interesting about uh, Lapsus specifically is uh, they're using our own methods and attacks against us. So you look at how they mostly go after organizations, they get compromised credentials, they go you know, through a VPN concentrator, uh, and they use that as a method to get in. Now, I'll talk about the multi-factor authentication thing in a second, but what I thought was interesting about uh, the original hacks from Lapsus when they first came out is that they lived predominantly in the cloud. Now, does anybody here feel like they have uh, equal or greater visibility in their cloud infrastructure than they do on their on-prem? No, right? None of us, we laugh at that because we're like, cloud visibility, what the hell is that? I don't even know what that means, right? And so using cloud infrastructure as a method of attack, and we see that with you know, uh, nation state actors in Russia focusing predominantly on cloud, China focusing predominantly on cloud, the ability to abuse cloud infrastructure as a way of going undetected gonna be and continue to be a major issue. Now, if you look at the Lapsus hack, and this came from uh, Michael Kazwara, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, but I thought it was a great representation of mapping um, the various uh, attacks against Uber directly to the MITRE attack techniques. And, um, what's interesting is the multi-factor authentication spamming stuff uh, works so well all the time. Like if you just sit there and you annoy the crap out of a user, they're gonna hit allow eventually. They're never gonna report it by the way. They're gonna see 50 attempts of multi-factor authentication. They're never gonna send anything to anybody in security and they're gonna eventually hit approve, especially on push notifications. Um, an interesting stat, we've been using a pretext uh, around multi-factor authentication, especially for push solutions for about a year now, we have a 100% success ratio with it, like 100% success ratio with it, we've never had an issue. If you send an SMS text message to the person you're going to try to get the push notification to, and let them know that there's gonna be an outage of your multi-factor authentication, so let's just say it's Microsoft, it looks like an automated message saying, hey, there's gonna be an outage between you know eight o'clock at night to nine o'clock at night, um, just so you know, you may get a multi-factor, you may have to re-authenticate via multi-factor authentication during this period of time due to this outage, and then you wait a couple hours, and then you send the multi-factor authentication request, they are gonna hit approve 100% of the time. 100% of the time. Push notifications suck. They're awful. They're the worst. Do not use push. Ever, in any way, shape, or form, ever use push notifications. But again, with this, what I thought was interesting is the reaction uh, from a lot of defensive folks out there around the surprise around finding, uh, so the Lapsus hackers, once they got access via VPN, via a compromised contractor that looks like the credentials were bought for, they moved laterally and just started scanning servers. Now, interesting enough, most organizations focus on TTPs or tactics, techniques, and procedures that are operating system focused, right? You have visibility in EDRs, whereas network has really gone by the wayside. We don't see a lot of network visibility anymore for most organizations uh, on the, the network detection and response side of the house. So interesting enough, they were scanning file shares, looking for open file shares, which I would say traditionally wouldn't get picked up by most companies out there. And then they found a uh, PowerShell script that contained hard-coded passwords uh, for their psychotic PAM system, which, uh, whoops, that's like, like the one thing you don't want admin credentials to. That's like your access management for your entire company, right? But the surprise around that was really interesting by the industry. Let me tell you, um, the things that I have seen on networks is absolutely astonishing, okay? And this is no surprise to me seeing hard-coded admin credentials in a PowerShell script 
the things that, that I've seen and the most, most horrible network things that you can possibly imagine are out there almost in every single network you can possibly imagine. It's just, it's just whether or not an attacker finds it before you do, right? And, and I'm, I'm sure Uber, we know Uber has a dedicated security program. I know a number of folks that have worked there before. I mean, they have procedures, they have processes, they have governance, they have you know, code analysis, they have penetration tests, they have red teams. They have a mature security program and for them to fall you know, by this specific type of attack does not surprise me in any way, shape or form. So what's changed between 10 years ago to today from an adversary perspective? What's interesting in the ransomware side is that the ransomware groups have specializations, just like we do in our industry. You know, I specialize, I gave the very first ever PowerShell security talk. So I created the whole PowerShell security industry, which is really weird to say that, I'm, but I did. Um, and so I got to work with Jeff Snover who wrote PowerShell and I did the first ever PowerShell security talk at DEF CON um, and released a bunch of stuff there and continued to advance that stuff. And then, you know, Lee Holmes obviously did a lot of great work uh, in PowerShell. We all have our own specializations around what we do and what we like to, to see. Same thing for ransomware. You know, from ransomware as a service perspective, you have folks that specialize in the delivery and weaponization, the C2 initial access components. You have folks that specialize in circumventing multi-factor authentication. Uh, you know, you have folks that specialize in the backend infrastructure for encryption, decryption, and payment. So all of these things together have specializations that allow these groups to have higher level of capabilities and work with one another to become better. Same thing from a nation state perspective. Obviously, unlimited funding equates to typically higher level capabilities, what we see out there. And we never really had that before. You know, we had groups out there that would hack into things. We had groups that, you know, would have less sophisticated type of attacks, the, you know, um, uh, the business email compromises, those types of things of changing invoices, but never groups that had equal capabilities uh, than, uh, as, as nation states from an organized crime group perspective. And so now we have groups that adapt to our organization's infrastructure. They manually attack organizations. They look at their infrastructure, they map it out, they figure out what products we have in place and they get after it. What's interesting is that it's not always spear phishing or social engineering. We saw with Colonial Pipeline uh, where they got compromised credentials, they had a backup VPN concentrator that didn't have multi-factor authentication, authenticated to that, figured out what antivirus product they were using, disabled the endpoint protection products on those systems, and then went from there and had full access to their infrastructure. Manual attacks, manual hacks, manual penetration like we would typically do as a penetration tester or researcher. Conti leaks showed the same thing. They had operational playbooks that showed how to methodically go after organizations so they can reproduce it to larger masses. So again, we have a, a time now where we have organized crime groups that have the same type of capabilities as nation states. And that's alarming, obviously, because it hits every industry demographic uh, uh, out there. But today, we have all this stuff. We have multi-factor authentication. We have you know, telemetry data that allows us to see information out there. We have zero trust, which is network segmentation, which zero trust is a whole other discussion point. I won't get into all that. Um, yeah, OK. Uh, perimeter security, education awareness, endpoint visibility, minimization of users, trying to reduce lateral movement. We have all this stuff that we know works but it takes ages for us to actually get implemented in our own environments. Like forever, zero trust. Has anybody here ever implemented a, a, an amazing zero trust model in their environment? If you did, you probably have a cloud infrastructure uh, that started off at a smaller size company that allowed you to go and do that, but most organizations aren't in that, that type of situation. So we have adaptive adversaries, okay? And what adaptive means is the ability to look at an organization and change your techniques and procedures to that organization to customize and to circumvent detections. And I'm gonna show you a couple demos here in a few minutes uh, around that uh, for some cool stuff. Um, but again, the specializations and the monetary gain for these have really amplified what we're seeing and we're seeing them shift very much to cloud. So let's talk about some fun. Um, so talking about adapting and using research that's out there to do really cool things. Just recently we released, uh, fairly um, recently, like two days ago, um, a beacon object file or a BOF that allows you to extract uh, the Office tokens directly through, through memory. So um, if you're using Teams, if you're using Office, you're using any of those things, you have the ability to extract the uh, uh, tokens directly from memory. In that specifically, um, uh, XOR, if you're familiar with XOR, or Mr. Doc, sorry. Uh, Mr. Doc put a uh, public uh, blog out about how to do this. We had been using it for a, a, quite a while internally at TrustedSec. We just didn't publish our, our research. And uh, we released a bot that allows you to extract the, um, the tokens directly into memory. 
and then use that from somewhere else. And what's cool about that is it works on 32 and 64-bit. Once you get the um, session tokens, you can take those session tokens and replay them on a different machine which circumvents multi-factor authentication. So if you compromise a machine that's logged into Office or if it's logged into Teams, you can extract those tokens, grab those tokens, use it on a different machine that circumvents and still have persistent access um, to that infrastructure directly through extracting. So let's take a look at how that works. So here you can see the team servers on the right-hand side. And on the right-hand side, um, we're going to be using our tool that extracts all of the Office tokens directly into memory. And we're going to highlight some of those so you can't see them. And over here, we have to, we have to parse that data. Um, so here's our Office token here. And we need to parse that data so that we can get the um, tokens directly off of there. So the latest uh, PR that was, or the latest uh, pull request that was put into uh, the, the BOF allows you to dump the token as well as uh, parse the token and then replay that token directly on another machine. So in here, this is from Scott on our research division, Scott Nussbaum. And so we're going to parse that. And you can see here the full parse token that you can use directly on a different machine, which is fantastic. So if you compromise a machine, you get initial access, the ability to extract those tokens directly from there, and then from there use it on a different machine, and then go through all their emails, go through their team's infrastructure, uh, whatever is uh, very much possible. Circumvents multi-factor authentication because you already have access to the machine and that token. Uh, but again, you can play it on a different machine. Does it need to be on the same machine you compromise, which is nice. Now, that doesn't get detected by anything, which is great as well. Um, and that's the big thing here is attack customization. When you're changing and, and customizing uh, your attack towards an organization, you're typically, typically going to circumvent uh, their detection criteria. I'll tell you a quick story about SMS phishing. Um, SMS phishing is probably one of my favorite things to do because uh, it, it, it can allow you to have somewhat of a believable pretext or attack. So if you can prep a person ahead of time, it allows them to be more successful, it allows you to be more successful in your pretext. And um, talking about push notifications, there was an organization that I did a, a spear phishing attack against, and I, I, I was targeting two people in the research division for this company. And it was the two targets that had access to the data that I needed for my specific attack. And I spent like a whole week researching these individuals, building uh, you know, a completely fabricated infrastructure that looked real and believable. And when you're doing social engineering, you have to build a story that looks real, right? It's completely fake, a completely fake infrastructure, completely fake everything else, but the story you have to tell that person can't trigger any type of, this is weird, this shouldn't be happening, or else it burns your whole infrastructure. So I spent the whole week doing this, and I had a, a kind of a two-layer attack. The first layer was um, capture their credentials. The second layer was remote code execution, to gain code execution onto their system so I can get access to their, their system from a command and control perspective. Um, so I sent the fishes out to these two individuals, and literally immediately I got two uh, usernames and passwords sent back to me. Username, password, got them, cool. My remote code execution stuff failed, though, because I misconfigured something, unfortunately, which happens all the time. Um, and I didn't get the shell that actually dropped onto the box. So I'm like, OK, well, at least I have credentials. Let me see what they have from an MFA perspective. And then I'll build in you know, an MFA pretext attack that I can get their second factor. And so I go to log into their VPN concentrator. And unfortunately, it remembered their last uh, configuration and said, we're sending a push notification uh, to you to make sure that this is actually you. I'm like, oh, crap. Like, it's sending a push notification to the person I just fished with the username and password. I'm going to get busted, and my whole, you know, attack is going to be completely wasted. I just wasted a whole week of work, so I'm going to have to tear this down. I'm going to have to build a whole new pretext. I'm going to have to go after this again. I have to do this whole thing over and over again uh, to deal with it. And so, like, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go get a bourbon because it's going to be a long night. So I go get a bourbon, and I come back, and by the time I get back, uh, it, I, I was magically logged into the, the, the VPN concentrator. I'm like, well, that's, that's weird. Um, and the user's like, well, I'm probably logging in from somewhere and hit approve. Because again, push notifications are awful. Um, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, I, with push notifications, if you uh, set your geographic location to the general location of that individual or the corporate offices, they typically will almost always hit approve. So the geolocation coupled with, uh, you know, sending a notification typically works almost every time. Now, when we talk about attacking organizations and going after an organization, what's important to note is when you customize your attack and once you get initial access, you're playing on a field that you don't know about. So if you're running into an EDR product, you know that. That's a known entity. If I'm going against a specific EDR brand, you know that they have certain detections in place that I have to circumvent against. But if you go against a customized environment that has customized detections, you don't know the playing field. You don't know what's going to trigger to an analyst and what's not. 
So you have to really start to look at that and say, well, how do I change that behavior? So here's an example here, and um, this is, you know, circumventing AMSI is nothing new, and I'm just going to show you a demonstration of, of doing that. The reason for that is the types of detections that we have today are almost always very basic and granular to the specific attack that was seen. It's what we call more of one-to-one -one detection. So, you know, a, a EDR provider or an antivirus provider saw an attack in the wild through threat intelligence or previously disclosed data breaches, and they write a detection against that. EDRs are kind of the antivirus of the 1990s, but more so from a tactics, techniques, and procedures perspective. And so in this example here, I'm going to use my tool called Magic Unicorn. And this uses PowerShell, and it uses what's called an x86 downgrade attack, which injects shellcode directly into memory. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to use Meterpreter, which should be picked up by antivirus, right? You know, Meterpreter is something that's well known. I'm not going to use any obfuscation. I'm not going to change it in any way, shape, or form. And I'm just going to generate this code here. And I'm going to decode this, this, this PowerShell command so you can see the raw command that's going to be executed in the PowerShell interpreter. Now, really quick, just a brief introduction of what AMSI is, or the anti-malware scan interface. AMSI uh, is, is a, a hook into PowerShell that right, right when it's about to actually execute in the PowerShell interpreter, uh, there's a hook for AMSI, and it has what's called AMSI scan string and AMSI scan buffer. It'll take that code, it'll compare it to that, uh, a specific AMSI provider, that AMSI provider will scan that code to see if there's anything malicious in it. So we have to get around the AMSI provider, essentially. In this case, it's going to be Windows Defender. And so we run this tool, and we're going to decode our code. And we can see here, here's our decoded code here. And this is just, uh, if you piece this together, it's just running invoke expression to inject our, our code directly into memory. And we're going to execute it over here in the PowerShell interpreter in our Windows machine. I also need to create a listener to capture uh, the shell if it works. And over here, we hit play. We notice it gets a little bit blurry, but uh, you notice here it says it's malicious content. So it blocks that specific thing from actually executing. So in this specific case here, when you start to look at how do I get around this, we have to understand where is the detection coming from. Same thing from an EDR product perspective. Where is the detection coming from? Is everybody familiar with uh, living off the land, binaries and scripts, right? So law bins are executables that are code signed typically by the operating system or a third-party platform that give you additional functionality, whether that's download or execute. Attackers will commonly use those to abuse them to get code execution onto systems or to do certain types of functionality that get around application control or application or allow, or allow listing. A good example of bypassing detection criteria is if you use RegSVR32, which is one of the most common ones that you typically see out there that is very nefarious. Most organizations don't ever use that binary, especially from the user land side. So if you see that, you know something's actually wrong. Uh, but most EDRs and most antivirus products will completely shut down the use of RegSVR32 with certain parameter types. So if you're using like slash S, slash I, slash U, uh, it'll automatically block that. But if you take RegSVR32 and you couple it with something like wget or bits admin, and you use that to download the scriptlet object, and then you call that without using the slash i parameter for the, uh, the not, uh, not using the download functionality, it circumvents the detection criteria because you're not using all of those parameters to execute code. So very fragile detections. And again, if we're just a novice type of attacker, just by manipulating a little bit of our code, we circumvent those detection criteria as environments. So if I remove the evoke expression side, if I just move the IEX part, the last part here, notice here it doesn't actually trigger uh, the antivirus alert. So now we have to figure out, well, where is it actually you know, coming from? And all I'm going to do is I'm going to split this line up and say A equals that part of the code. I'm going to make that say A. Can't be that easy, right? It is that easy. Um, and it executes. So just by splitting up that last command where that detection was written from, we circumvent AMSI, the AMSI provider that's scanning that code, and we get our shell on the other side just by making some minor modifications to the code itself. So again, very fragile detections in our environments, especially from third-party product perspectives that are supposed to be the backbone of our security programs, right? Well, I hate to tell you this, but if you solely rely off of uh, security products to fix your bad security practices, you're already on. Technology is not going to fix the issues that you find today. It's not really Morgan Freeman, by the way. I just threw that in there. Um, but I always hear his voice when I say it. It's the best part. Um, but the, 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 the poor security practices that we have cannot be fixed by pieces of technology. Unfortunately, it requires us understanding visibility into our environment, what's going on in our environment, and being able to go from there. MSDT.exe is a great example. So MSDT.exe, the Felina attack that came out recently, right? 
Um, that was a law bin that allowed for remote code execution, especially in office documents. And everybody was panicking about that, and there was no detections when it came out. But if you look at the research, research came back, dates back to all the way back to 2015, around showing how you can use Folina, uh, use msdt.exe as a way for code execution on the systems. It just didn't allow code execution through Office. Someone hadn't figured that, that component out yet. So we knew this is already problematic, and it was already being abused in the wild, but there's no detections for it because, again, the fragility of our infrastructure is really based on how popular is this attack, you know, uh, how many people download this tool, and ultimately what signatures were actually written for this to be identified. And so, again, you know, it's one of those things where the fragile parts of our, our, our infrastructure are really, really important. And what we'll typically see from a, a research perspective um, is that there'll be research on a specific attack, but there might not be a tool released or a way to actually go and do it. And so then there's no detections written. Uh, we'll be releasing very soon. This came from uh, an obscure blog post from Sophos back in 2019 uh, looking at password managers, uh, password vaults. And one of the bullet points in the article talks about how LastPass doesn't erase um, the hash that's in memory even when the vault is closed. So we decided to take a look at that research, and we've been using this for over a year um, you know, to extract the vaults directly from memory um, on anybody that has LastPass installed. And then again, no, no detections, don't have to worry about anything. We can, if, it, if somebody has LastPass installed and they're using the browser plugins, it's no issue for us whatsoever. Um, and so uh, we'll be releasing a tool re uh, soon in the next couple of, of days um, that uh, automatically searches through uh, Chrome extensions uh, and uh, for Chrome and Brave and will automatically extract the uh, master password hash directly off of that that then gets salted that allows you to open up the vault that allows you to extract all of the um, you know passwords that are contained within that vault even if the person's logged off so it the, so if, if I'm on a Windows machine and I log into the password vault and I log off of it that password's still stored in memory uh, in, a, in a hash format that hash format then you, you salt it and then uh, authenticate to the offline uh, uh, password vault and allows you to extract those. In addition, if you're on a machine that has it and you just wait, the clear text password is stored in memory for a few minutes uh, during that period of time as well. So you're able to extract that clear text password out of memory if you need to. Uh, again, all the things that you can do directly from there. But again, things that are already researched that attackers, if they look at it, they build tools around it and they start to uh, you know, automatically do those different things. So that's why you know, when you look at how fragile our infrastructure and environments are today, uh, when it comes to security, you know, again, minor tweaks, minor changes completely circumvents most detection programs that are out there today, especially if you're relying specifically off of tools or products. What I find to be most effective is when you make detections your own. A good example, we were doing a red team engagement for a really sophisticated, I'd say, you know, 1% of what we deal with from a red teaming perspective type of customer. It was a, a financial institution. Real difficult to get into. Um, and we have six month engagements where we have basically six months to break into them. It's a longer term spread out red team engagement. So we start building tools and weaponize our stuff and look at their infrastructure, try to figure out the best ways in. And uh, we had done this awesome hack. And we have our own C2 um, that's internal that you know, doesn't get detected by anything, which is awesome. And we get access to this box. It takes us like three months. You know, we get a zero day, we get access to their machine, compromise it, and then we have command and control established, no detections. Great. Everything's perfect right now from an initial access perspective. Everything's going wonderful. We were high-fiving each other. You know, it took three months to get to this point, and we finally get there, and we're on this machine in this highly secured environment and customer without any detections. We start looking at the systems, and we hooked the API for who am I, okay? Just to see what we're running at. We didn't run the who am I command, because that would be not a good idea. We wanted to see what user account we're running on, or we hooked the API for it. They had a rule set up in their environment that if anything is querying who am I, even the API, and it's a non-technical user, to trigger an alarm. And so because it was a non-technical user, they baselined their users in two different AD groups. You know, if you had like a web developer title or an IT admin, you were in a technical group. If you're in a non-technical group and you triggered that, it automatically triggered an alarm. We got busted and they shut off our access. So it was like three months worth of work and totally busted us. I'm like, crap, that sucks. You know, worst day ever for us, and we definitely were not high-fiving at that period of time. Um, and so it's the things that are your own that make it very difficult for us as, as attackers to understand. Deception is another great example. If you have deception in your environment and we're sitting there trying to run over landmines, you know, you have 
fake credentials stored in memory, or there's a folder in there that looks like it has credentials in it, we authenticate to a machine that you know, is a honey system that now triggers alarms. We don't know the difference as attackers typically. One of my favorite ones that I saw in an, in an organization is um, they had a um, run as script that would uh, run on every single user account that looked like a service account. That service account, if you looked at the permissions and the description, because uh, we were already authenticated as a normal user, we can get the descriptions out of AD, it was a backup uh, service account for uh, one of their backup softwares. Um, it looked legitimate, le legitimate as hell. So we get the username and password. It's got domain admin rights, of course, because every backup service needs domain admin rights. Um, and I'm like, all right, cool, we're in. Like, this is the easiest assessment ever. We got initial access, we got the machine, we got a domain admin account. I go to authenticate and it says invalid password. I'm like, oh, that's really weird. And uh, it triggered all hell alarms, you know, honeypots, uh, stuff. They had put the, the systems and uh, the username and passwords in memory with a bad password, which authenticated to a domain controller that should never have been using that username and password because it was a honey, honey credit account. It totally busted us in those environments. It's hard for us to differentiate detections in an environment that is based on an environment's, uh, the environment itself. It's just really difficult for us as attackers to do that. So let's talk about looking ahead. What does that look like um, in environments and how do we get better with what we're seeing out there? We obviously saw that it's fairly easy to circumvent and get around detection criteria today if we're using commodity things, things that are built into tools, things that are built into products that we use are usually less of a concern for us than things that are built in environments that people understand. And I think uh, we had a good start with things like the MITRE attack framework. The problem with MITRE is that almost everybody uses MITRE as a checklist. So you see a TTP, you write a detection for a TTP, or does my product actually have those? You, you don't take it into account, like, let's baseline my environment, and let's look for things like RegSphere 32 Does RegSphere 32 ever execute from under the context as a regular user? No. Okay, anytime that process is ever created, regardless, irrespective of you know, uh, uh, variable flags or you know, flag arguments, we're gonna alert on that to investigate. Understanding our environment is really, really important. Same thing for lateral movement. Do you typically have an administrator account from the same source on workstations logging into other workstations from a workstation to workstation communication perspective? Probably not. Those are the things that you kind of have to start to look at and say, these are weird in my environment. And you look at ransomware groups, the, the terrifying thing about ransomware groups is they're using legitimate applications, tooling, and software, not necessarily uh, you know, uh, C2s or, or implants or you know, hacker tools like Impact. It's, I'm not saying that Impact is a hacker tool. It's a great tool. It's amazing. Um, to go and do all the awesome stuff that they do, they use legitimate applications. They use RDP. They use PS exec. Um, interesting enough, we were doing a threat hunt on an organization recently, and we looked at all the remoting tools in an organization. And there's a concept you can apply to data called the long tail. If you're not familiar with it, it was a book that came out in like the 60s. Uh, it has nothing to do with, with data. But applying the same concept of, if there's a lot of noise up here, this is probably normal. The high noise stuff is probably normal. When you start looking down the tail and you have these, these, these tail parts that are very minimum as far as noise, like maybe one or two processes that are executing in your environment, those are the things that you wanna take a look at and say, hey, is that normal in my environment? And so we started looking at all remoting software in the organization. You can see, hey, they're using this remoting software all over here, but there's these two instances of remoting software that's not used across the entire company. That's really weird. So we ended up uh, uh, talking to the customer. They reached out to the two individual workstations that had this remote software on there. And the two individuals were like, yeah, I just got a call from IT yesterday. Um, and uh, they told us that we had installed this remoting software so that you know, they could fix a, an issue with our computer. So they just downloaded and installed the remoting software, which happened to be you know, TeamViewer, which wasn't used in their entire environment. So you know, using legitimate applications, calling up on the phone, these are all things that are possible now that are very difficult to identify and detect. I mean. Would anybody's detection capabilities identify that specific type of attack in their environment? Maybe, maybe not. Again, if we have customized detections, maybe, but using legitimate uh, remote software, we'll see. So some basic principles that we need. Telemetry today is so important. Uh, storage is cheap. I'm not saying you need full packet captures and everything else, but storage is relatively inexpensive. It's a lot more inexpensive than it was 10 years ago uh, from a data perspective. Uh, telemetry in our cloud infrastructure, telemetry from on-premise infrastructure, network telemetry is amazing. All of those things together really start to paint the picture of what our environment looks like and what we need to start to do to understand deviations of patterns of behavior. You look at a lot of the texts that come out in the security industry on Twitter or whatever else, 
their one-to-one -one detections. They are looking very specific for very specific things in specific environments. And those are great from a response perspective or to see if we've had that very similar attack that was seen over here. But uh, you know, two weeks go by, a few hours go by, a month goes by, that attack is changing. That attack is completely different than the attack that was originally here. And your one-to-one -one detection is, isn't necessarily as valid as it used to be. So one-to-one -one detections are good. Those are things that we want to look for in our environment from previously known data breaches, attacks, things to that effect. But the understanding of our own environment and the behavior that, that's exhibited around there becomes extremely important. And from there, baselining and monitoring. Um, you know, RegSPR 32 is a great example because, again, you don't see that everywhere. But PowerShell is a whole other example. PowerShell is used everywhere, isn't it? But it's also used very heavily by attackers. But does everybody need a full-fledged programming language at their fingertips? Does Bob and Sales need a PowerShell runtime environment? Probably not. So how do we reduce our behavior and understand that and say, well, if PowerShell is being run under the context of a regular user account, minus these exception you know, uh, groups that are development or whatever, is that something we want to investigate and look at? Or can we block that specifically in our environment because not everybody needs access to PowerShell. We don't have any applications that run it or we have to put exceptions in place. Baselining and exceptions are really what's most effective and those are the things that really shut us down from an attacker's perspective. Again, going into an environment that has customized detections that is based off of their own environment and their own behavior is a nightmare for us. It's very difficult for us to understand what you have. Now, there are ways around that too. Um, if you go into an environment that has a mature detection program, what the story you tell is really important. So if you're using uh, obfuscated code, you're using a PowerShell code that's heavily manipulated, it's obfuscated, it has you know, uh, substitution variables, it has injection of, of PowerShell, and if an analyst looks at that, they're gonna be like, yeah, that's, that's malicious, like that's horrible, right? But if you download a PowerShell script from the internet that's 500 lines of code, and you put in the you know, comment section, you do a LinkedIn OSINT you know, re research on the, the environment, and you say, who's the head of IT in this, in this organization? And you put a comment code in here saying, this is what we use for data telemetry metrics you know, written by the head IT person in your environment. And then halfway through that code, you throw your malicious code in there, you know, line 470. Is an analyst really gonna go through 470 lines of, of code to identify that one malicious line of code when it's already you know, authored by the main IT person in your environment? Probably not. So there are ways that we can get better from an offensive perspective uh, to tell a different story when we know we're gonna be seen in environments. But I rarely have to use that because most of the time the monitoring detection capabilities in most organizations are, are, are pretty weak. So getting into some last things here and I'll open up for some questions. There's a lot of cool things that we can do in our environments to make it more secure. These are basics that we all know about. I'm not gonna sit here and rehash, you know, hey, you all should do network segmentation. We've been talking about that since like 1990. Um, you know, hey, you should patch your systems. Hey, we've been talking about that since 1990. Um, but really there are things that can shut things down very quickly. You know, network segmentation is really important. Workstation, workstation communication. If you look at the crux of all the damages that we see from most of these types of attacks, it's lateral movement. It's the ability to move from one system to the next system to the next system to the next system until they get access to the data that they want to, so they get access to the backup, so they get access to everything else, and they steal that data, they encrypt all that data, and they send it out. Preventing lateral movement in some way, shape, or form will make a very big deal to reducing the amount of damage that you have from a specific attack, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Can we respond faster to a successful attack because we know we're not gonna be perfect, or can we reduce the amount of damage that happens if we don't detect it in our own environment? And that's ultimately the, the battle that we have. Prevention takes a long time to implement. Would everybody agree with that? Like to, to make a big change in your environment, does it happen overnight? Can you do allow listing or application control overnight in your, in your environment? No, it takes time, right? Unless you have an awesome program that, that allows you to break everything in your environment, then that, that's awesome for you, that's, that's cool. But most, time you're, most of the time, you're not gonna be able to make big sweeping changes of protection in your environment immediately. And that's what we really have to think about is that yes, we have multiple ways that we need to secure our environments. It's gonna take time. Our businesses are gonna have to ride with us eventually down that road. We're gonna have to eventually implement multi-factor authentication, which I thought was really interesting. Um, at Blue Hat, they released a stat, something like uh, out of all Office 365 members, only 76% uh, did not have multi-factor authentication enabled, which I thought was like a really low number. So only 30% or so of multi-factor authentication is enabled on uh, Microsoft 365, which is a horrible thing to think about. 
But again, those preventative things will take time. So how do we get faster as an industry to respond quicker to attacks that we know it's going to take time to actually shut down and prevent? And that's really through telemetry data and understanding our environments, being able to pull that data back and respond much more effectively in the event that we're actually attacked or hit. And again, the difference between 10 years ago and today is we're focusing on the patterns of behavior that attackers use across the board. What does it look like from a lateral movement perspective? What does it look like when we do privilege escalation? What does it look like when we extract clear text credentials out of memory? What does it look like when we get access to a domain controller? Those types of attacks and abuse of AD permissions and everything else allows us to really paint a picture of what's commonly known attacks in the environment. I mean, most attackers are going to try to inject into LSAS and extract you know, clear text passwords or hash values out of memory. They're going to look for things like printer spool options, uh, unconstrained delegation. They're going to look for service principal names or SPNs. They're going to do LLMNR, or local link multicast name resolution protocol, or NetBouse name services. They're going to do all of those things pretty much across your network consistently. And again, if we can piece together what that looks like from a behavior perspective in our environment, we have a much better chance of really actually uh, defending against these things. So my final thoughts, and I'll open up for any questions that we have, is that you know, security is still complex. I mean, you look at the attacks that are being used today, uh, you know, HarmJoy and those folks release the stuff on the, the CA abuse stuff that you can do. That'll be around for the next 10 years. LLM, LLMNR will still be around for another 10 more years. You know, uh, all of this, these, these misconfigurations, uh, ways of abusing Active Directory, ways of abusing misconfigurations in environments are gonna continue to be around and most organizations don't even know they exist because we're not continuously focusing on that. So until we reduce the complexity, um, it's gonna be more complex for us to actually address those security concerns. And for me, until we can make security industry and understandable for everybody, uh, which is a really hard thing uh, to say um, or to do, uh, we're gonna continue to see a lot of the breaches that we see today from a lot of these different organized crime groups. And they're only gonna continue to get better and better and better and diversify and specialize in different areas and continue to focus on going after organizations and companies. But with that, I'd like to open up for any questions. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Got a question here? Awesome. He's got a, he's got a mic here. It's got to be a really nice question, though, yeah. about Nano. Sure, test. Well, <laughs> oh, so actually it's VI versus Emacs, but I guess I'm that old. Ah, there you um, go. <laughs> nothing wrong with Nano or any of them. Um, we talk a lot about security, but like when it comes to critical infrastructure, there are safety implications to a sure. lot of this shit, too. Yep. And we talk about, well, this is going to be this way in 10 years, and it probably will be in 20. But like, defending is hard. Absolutely. What is your advice for a cash-strapped critical infrastructure provider that's trying to increase their safety margins yep. from a pen tester's perspective. What are some pragmatic things that can be done to increase safety? Yeah, good question. So critical infrastructure is a whole uh, plethora of discussion topics that I could talk quite a bit about on. Um, the issue with critical infrastructure you see is that you know these are systems that run, you know, energy that run medical treatment facilities that run a lot of other things that are really important for us. Uh, so when you look at what we define as critical infrastructure, these devices could be 10, 15, 20 years old. They have to go through a major accreditation process just to get patches put onto their, into their system. So they're going to be delayed. They're not going to be secure. They're not going to be secure out of the box. And they're very difficult from a black box perspective to even understand ports, protocols, hardening, everything else. And then you topple that with uh, the ability for um, uh, third-party vendor management to you know, remotely service those devices and have access to those. So I think when you look at uh, the best way to look at critical infrastructure, and what we see most of, of being the most effective is network segmentation as much as possible. Try to keep those segmented away in their, in their own individual island. That's the same thing you'd see for like legacy systems too. You know, if, you have, if you're in a business, and I'm sure no businesses here have uh, legacy systems that you're not allowed to touch or patch or anything like that. Everybody's gotten rid of all of those. Um, but uh, when you look at legacy systems, you know, you, you put them in what we call more high security zones where you have enhanced monitoring and detection capabilities, both network telemetry data that understand, you know, uh, PLCs or logic controller type information that understand uh, protocol analysis uh, that allow you to see, you know, new systems or devices that are coming in there. So a lot more monitoring uh, without touching those systems, uh, not being as aggressive as, as actually touching those systems in the first place and scanning them and trying to hack them. More so network segmentation and visibility, I think, is, is really critical in those environments. And I think, you know, you look at some of the tools that specialize in those, like Dragos, for example, has some really good 
um, t systems and tools that give you visibility in that environment. I'm not saying a tool's the right method for all the time, but the more network visibility that you have into those devices and the ability you have around attacks that are happening in those environments, and you have a nice tucked away network segment that allows, uh, that doesn't allow you know, enterprise or corporate infrastructure to be able to impact those, you have a much better, I think, way of being able to address the security concerns there. So you know, not easy, easier said than done, by the way, very difficult to do because again, the ports protocols analysis documentation often lacks, especially if it's 15, 20 years old. But again, something that's very doable. We've seen it work in a lot of other companies too. So more, you know, we see SCADA infrastructure, that type of stuff, the more segmentation you can do across that, the better. Good question. Any other questions? Got one back there? It's gonna make you walk. You gotta run, you gotta run. <laughs> Careful, the steps change in size. So I, I learned that the hard way. Thank you very much. So uh, Hacking Dave, question for you. Um, most of the time during red team assessments, uh, we're trying to bypass uh, EDR solutions, like you said, it's the antivirus of uh, 1999. But in, in your opinion, if we have to advise a client uh, on, on which type of, of EDR software to use, what in your practice and, and what you've seen in, uh, out there is the most effective one right now? Because we've seen some unanimously based uh, EDRs that have no uh, further uh, uh, TTPs, for example, in there, they only look for anomalies. We think it's really strong because you go for the outliers that you say. You, you don't look at the, the top, but you really look at the outliers. But we also see, of course, uh, the regular EDRs. Really looking for some, uh, yeah, some answers there. Yeah, um, so specific vendors I don't necessarily uh, go into in my talks. You know, but what I can say is the ones that will provide you the most amount of telemetry data and visibility for you to be able to understand what's going on in your infrastructure is going to be the best solution for you. So I actually, like, from a vendor perspective, uh, I actually really like Carbon Black uh, from the fact that, but, it, but it's something that you, you need, like, 50 people to manage uh, and, like, another 100 people to support it. So that doesn't necessarily make sense in most organizations. But, you know, the visibility you get from that type of product is absolutely incredible, right? But again, you need an extremely large and mature program to actually go and implement something like that. But I, what I'll say about uh, the visibility and telemetry side is, you know, the ones that have one-to-one -one detections aren't bad, but what does it have on top of that that allows you to build what's specific to your environment? And you mentioned the anomaly detection components of it. They're coming out a lot now, and I hate to use the buzzwords, but more like machine learning about like, hey, what does your environment look like? What are deviations of that data? What does that actually look like? You know, same source address, you know, uh, coming from multiple VPN, con or, uh, you know, multiple source, uh, source address coming from the same account from a VPN concentrator. Those are gonna be, you know, anomalies that you want to investigate. The biggest crux that you have to look at is, how do I take that behavior in my environment, which is gonna be very noisy, shrink it down to where it's manageable in my own environment so that when an analyst gets it, it's not the 9,000th false positive that he misses that ends up being that specific attack that he's already seen nine other thousand false positives before, but it happens to be a real one this time. So, you know, for me, I, I, I look at it as a detection engineering problem, not necessarily a uh, product problem. So if you have detection engineers that are continuously willing away at the exceptions and focusing more on refining that data, that's when you have a lot of success. So it's not necessarily a product perspective, it's having somebody that's smart to actually go through that data and make it intelligible so that you have good detections in place. Hopefully that makes sense. And I actually had a slide that I skipped past that I wanted to show really quick. Um, it, didn't, it was, uh, did any, you guys might be too young for this, but uh, we'll see. So, so, Seth Edwin, but um, where is it at? Where is it, here it is. Does anybody remember the anti-skip uh, protection on CD players and the anti-shock, right? It never worked at all. Like you'd, you'd get like three steps and it'd skip, but you had the anti-shock and you're like, did I actually have that button on for anti-shock that did absolutely nothing? Like you actually took apart the hardware, did nothing to actually do anti-shock uh, uh, at all. Yeah, that's good. Good, good analogy towards EDR products today. So um, any other questions? Happy to answer them. Got one back there. You said something about the uh, the MITRE framework be, uh, being used as a checkbox. Like uh, I found the same thing with uh, basically organizations are basically checking off the ISO 27XXX. 
yep. and other um, uh, well, other frameworks. Then again, yo, like if you don't do that, like I'm a big proponent not to do that. However, as you said, security is hard. Nobody understands it. So basically, following a checklist is something. But yep. what would be a suggested other approach yep. that people wouldn't just be checking the boxes instead of like uh, just saying, yeah, we need a mature program, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Like we know that, but yep. what's actionable? Yep. That's a good question. Uh, this is actually probably one of my favorite discussions to have because what is the value of MITRE tech? Is it the techniques and procedures or is it an understanding of capabilities of adversaries? And what I like, you know, I'll present the boards quite often. And if anybody's ever presented to a board before, and if, if you've ever heard board presentations, they're extremely dry and boring. You're talking about vulnerability management programs, like, hey, we had 200,000 vulnerabilities, now we only have 150,000 critical vulnerabilities. What does, that, what does that even mean? You know, like, a board member's like, I don't know what the hell that means. It sounds horrible still, you know? And you're like, oh, our governance program is doing this, and we're, we're hitting all of our key objectives for data loss prevention, which I've never been into an organization that actually had a DLP program that worked. Um, I've never had a DLP tool ever trigger on anything, let alone uh, a program that actually classifies data and goes across the whole business. So board meetings were often very difficult and challenging, I think, for security folks. I think MITRE kind of changed that because if you structure your meetings and your discussions less on these are the things that we're doing, but more so here's our adversaries that play in our industry verticals that we're concerned about, and here's their capabilities, and here's the programs that we have that are trying to address those capabilities from a concern perspective, uh, and you're layering that with the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the techniques and procedures section of MITRE, Again, one-to-one -one detections are still important. So hopefully I didn't dissuade people from writing one-to-one -one detections. I think those are still very important to have in your environment. But the difference is, is understanding who your adversaries are from an offensive perspective so you can build a solid defense. So by, by looking at their capabilities and saying, well, here's the 10 groups that minor tracks that are important to us. Those are the, the ones that we're gonna prioritize from a tactics, techniques, and procedures perspective. And here's how we're gonna look at this in our environment. They commonly use PS exec. Okay, well, in our environment, what uses PS exec? Okay, we're gonna put exceptions in just for those systems, and then we're gonna look for deviations of patterns of behavior P for PS exec, or they're heavily using PowerShell exploitation. Okay, what does PowerShell look like in our environment? Those are the things that we can do to start to build our own detections across our own environments that allow us to go above and beyond the one-to-one -one mappings that you see from a detection criteria perspective that are more, more flexible because they're our own. And that's the, the concept that I'm trying to say here is that the one-to-one -one detections are fine. They're going to get the low-hanging fruit. They're going to get the previously you know, disclosed attacks that attackers haven't modified in 10 years or five years or whatever ends up being. But when we start making detections our own in our own environments, that's when it becomes really challenging for these adversaries to be successful. And I think that's ultimately what we have to focus on as drive for in security is that discussion around the actors and attackers. And I think that's what MITRE did really well. Um, and then ultimately, how do we build defenses around that? Good question. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think I'm out of time. So thank you all so much for having me. Brucon, it's been amazing. I'll be around. But uh, thank you all for having me. Appreciate it.